Hi, everyone. Is everyone on? Welcome, welcome. I am Chef Claudette out of my kitchen here in San Diego, California. Uh, welcome to my Heston Supper Club. This is my maiden voyage for my stove at the hotel. You can a lot at home. Uh, but before we get started on what we're going to do today, I want to introduce a lot of you to me if you don't know who I am or what I do. Uh, I am a chef based here out of San Diego, California. I've been cooking for about 20 years. Uh, the last five years really focusing on uh, looking at the cultural anthropology of food and what you see in these recipes are a lot of that journey. Um, you get some of Mexico, some of Europe, some of North African cuisine. And that's just because that's how I am, you know, this is how I dress to cook at my restaurants. It's extra, it is unconventional, but I am 100% unconventional. Um, my last project was El Jardín, very, very big learning experience and was my introduction to Hessen. Actually, I got to design my own Hessen suite and I am just as jazzed to have the hotel have also this. It's the new, this is like the new Rolls Royce at the hotel. This is the main signature kitchen. It's called Baga. Uh, Baga is a nickname that I've had my entire life, which means kind of like gypsy wanderlust. And before we get started, I want to show you guys my view. So every morning when I come to work, hope you guys don't get motion sick. When I come to work, this is, chefs normally work in, Kind of a dungeon-y places so if i can get this right there we go this is my view when i come in to work not a bad gig huh so the hotel is slated to open to the public mid-april and right now it's still very much in construction there's still a lot of cardboard but this is home okay so let's go back to the kitchen and for those of you that are cooking along with me, be patient with yourself. This is a very ambitious cooking class. I am a very ambitious person. So obviously the recipe is reflect that. And don't feel pressured like to, uh, sorry, not my hand, to be at the same speed as I am. If you have questions, please ask them. Uh, we do have Cupid moderating all the questions. So if you don't hear me answer them right away, I will get to them. But essentially, today's Hessen Supper Club will be featuring all of the Nano Bond cookware. And I am extremely picky with who I partner up with and the brands that I use. And obviously, Hessen is, has been a pretty big part of my career the last five years. And when I got a hold of the pots and pans, just tell you one thing I always put things in front of my kids to kind of like bang it around. I did that with my glassware for the restaurant. And my son texted me when I brought these pans to the restaurant this morning. And he said, where are my pans? Because he didn't have his pans to make food with. So they are strong enough to withstand the use of a 17 year old, very ambitious uh, at home cook. So please don't take my word for it. Grab them yourselves and see how sturdy they are. I love the fact that they are nonstick and they I want to have everyone yelling at me if I use a silver or a stainless steel appliance or sorry, spoon on my pan. Please don't scratch. It's pretty amazing. Uh, my favorite part of it is cooking rice in the all of the pots, but this guy is my rice pot. I go wipe it with a napkin afterwards, nothing sucks. So huge fan. All right. We're gonna make chicken. Papas, uh, papas a la guacaina, which is a Peruvian dish, and crepes, which is my daughter's favorite thing, and her middle name is Love. So I got very apropos. Uh, we're going to start with the chicken part, and then we're going to bounce around. So again, be patient with yourself if you're cooking along with me. Ask questions if you have any, and we'll get going. So this is whenever I do cooking classes, I always try to make it a big point on the chef. So sometimes I also have the notes with me because a lot of the times we, you know, riff and we just cook instinctually, but I want to make sure you guys have the best tools and um, teach you time management is huge for us. And a little 
funny tidbit. All of our, all of the hotel is a wellness component to it. Alila Marea is the hotel, uh, the restaurant saga. Uh, Alila Marea started, or Lila, the brand, started in Southeast Asia, and they are zero to landfill um, in Bali, a couple other locations in Southeast Asia. But imagine a hotel in the United States being 1% to zero to landfill. That's our mission. So these are my cooking gloves, which are very big, but they're compostable. So no single use plastic on the entire property. A big win. All right, we'll start with the chicken. So when I decided what the menu was gonna be, I thought, what do I wanna eat with my significant other? Or in bed by myself watching rom-coms. Chicken is always a good option. And I, you know, certain things will be, if you have too much food, obviously you don't want to have a really heavy dinner. So you don't have to use all of it. I'm going to show you guys how to butcher a whole chicken, but I'm only going to use the chicken breast. If it's for two, that's perfect. Or you can half your chicken. Or you can just buy chicken breast. I won't, I won't be there to care. It's fine. I promise I won't judge you. So we remove the backbone and I, Kind of got it already started since we are, you know, this is time is an issue. So if you see your chicken, sorry, if whoever's on here that's a vegetarian, uh, chicken backbone, super, super easy to go through the sides of the spine. So you run your knife along the side of the spine. Kitchen shears are amazing. I even use them when I need to butcher really, really fast. So you go down the sides of the spine and then when you get to the bottom, you should be able to just snap off that hip and then just rip. Sorry, look away if you don't like stuff like that. Save the bones. Obviously we have stocks in our lives and they're delicious. Now what I do is I snap it. So you grab your chicken and you just kind of bust it open. <laughs> so you see, you can use a little knife in that cartilage, snap it. And what you do when you snap breast in half, you expose that chest bone and then you just put your hand around the top of the bone and you pull back towards yourself and the cartilage just comes right out. So this is a, a good party trick if you want to freak people out at your parties, that's the thing. So then you have a spatchcock chicken. It's completely flat. This is my favorite way to cook most poultry. Uh, Thanksgiving, you make your turkey this way and you just cut yourself half of the cooking time. So it comes in very, very handy. All right, and then we're gonna flip it upside down, skin up, and we're gonna trim any excess skin, fat, anything that needs to go away and that's just not appetizing to eat, trim the skin. Save the skin, you can make chicharron, a little chicken rind. And we're gonna take the legs off. So chickens, like most animals, all at the joints come apart incredibly easy. So you see this line right here at the tip of the bottom of the breast. Just run your knife through that and it's gonna separate immediately. So people always laugh at my trajectory in the industry. I've been cooking for 20 years professionally. I started off as a pastry chef and I ended up as a butcher. <laughs> I learned charcuterie and then I went savory. Cause that's just, I mentioned I was unconventional, right? That's just one of the ways I am unconventional. All right, so you trim the leg off. Yeah. Save these for later, cook them whenever. I mean, just kind of make sure everything is out. You can clean these really, really well by taking all of those rib bones out up to you on how much work you want to do while you eat it. I'm just going to, the rib, if you're familiar with butchering and fish, the ribs come out pretty much like a fish. So just run your knife through the side and follow the muscles, follow the bones. All of the ribs come out in one fail to the And this recipe, Kind of a riff on my salsa mata, my Oaxacan chicken. It's so dang good and it makes you feel good. It's, you know, it's like spicy, lime forward, the umami chicken, I you know, that's another name I give it. And 
it's just one of those really soul satisfying dishes and everyone kind of, you know, oh, you know, chicken, it's so basic. Chicken can be really delicious if you give it a little love. And that's why we're doing it for Valentine's Day. All right, I think I'm good on my trim, I'm not sure. I want the chicken skin to be crispy, but I don't want it to get soggy right away afterwards. So it's trim it real well. Okay. Skin side up on your board. I'm gonna take one of my gloves off. Season generously with salt. And turn my stove on. You know what? If you're gonna sear anything, if you want crispy skin, you have to preheat your pan, skillet, sauce pot, whatever you have. That is one of the biggest reasons things get soggy and you don't create that crust. You need to steal all those juices in. Sure, you've seen a million Food Network shows talk about that. Um, there's a reason for it. It really is a thing. So please preheat your up uh, your pans, and also your meat should be at room ambient temperature. You shouldn't go from the refrigerator to your pan. It won't cook properly. If you want to hit that 160, 165 is that sweet spot for chicken. But that was also instilled in like 1970 something. If you get chicken. Nowadays, I mean, I just go on the crust and then I brine my chicken. So I also give it a little bit of an insurance policy. But 160 is the temperature that you need to hit at the thickest point of your chicken. And then when you take it out, you let it rest. It does carry over. So you'll hit 163. Two degrees will not kill you. All right, now this is pretty hot. Crazy using my stove for the first time. All right. We're gonna do a little bit of olive oil or blend oil. If you use olive oil, you just gotta move fast because it will smoke. So I have a little bit of blend, which is an 80% olive oil, 20% vegetable canola oil. I'm gonna go skin side down. You can hear that. That's what you want. Hot. All right, now I can take this guy off. Take my chicken board off. So this is gonna keep, I'm not gonna mess with it. Something that people also um, often do is they mess with the things in the pan. Don't mess with it. Just control your heat, so make sure you don't burn anything. I'm gonna drop a little bit of that chili oil. So this is my chili oil. You can buy it already in the grocery store. There's a really good Asian brand. This is a chili oil from my salsa matcha. Uh, if you want to make your own salsa matcha, you can find the recipe on my Instagram. Um, under my highlights. That's the the famous salsa matcha from El Jardín. And just keep it here. I'm not gonna mess with it. I'm gonna mess with it. I'm gonna take my own advice. So if you are cooking along with me, we're gonna go from here to crepe batter. Crepe batter, my daughter's favorite breakfast. Actually, she threatened me if I didn't come home with crepes, I couldn't come home. And you have to, in my opinion, let it rest. Uh, whenever you do anything with flour, you agitate it, you create a little toughness with that gluten development. And if you let it rest overnight, it's pretty perfect the next day. So if you're in a rush, I would at least let it sit for an hour at least, um, but overnight it's best. So I did get a little head. I will show you how to make it and I will show you what it should look like the next day. All right, so I think we're, Good to just peek at the bottom. It should be yeah, perfect. All right. So I salted the skin. I'm going to salt the top or the exposed inside of the breast pretty generously. And on the ingredient list, this is my bad. Again, sometimes I think like a chef and I think you should already know this, right? You can get in my head. Uh, you call for the onion and garlic. So I'm going to turn the heat down so I don't burn anything. I'm gonna cut up my, one second. I'm gonna cut up the onion and the garlic and the onion and the garlic go in with the chicken. I'll give you a rough chop, it doesn't really affect the size of it. Well, you want the flavor. You wanna flavor the chicken, you wanna flavor that oil. So a small, medium dice is sufficient. I'm gonna go straight in on the sides. Oh, 
on my garlic cloves. I can just smash the garlic. You want to get all those oils to come to the surface of the garlic. Just throw it in on the side, like if you were making a roast. And all of that oil, all those drippings from the chicken and the hot sauce, the chili oil, will just will be incredibly flavorful, aromatic all throughout. Move everything around. Give you guys a better here that everyone can see really good. I already see all of that coloring and the onions that fast. I'm just going to flip it upside down. Perfect. I probably could have gotten found, but I was in a rush. All right. You see that beautiful color on that chicken? We're going to pop it in the oven now. I am gonna go ahead and put a little bit of the butter that is safe for the end. I'm gonna put it on top of the chicken now. And again, it's going to make an, it's already crispy, but imagine it rendering with, it's like you're cooking the skin. So it's just cooking it in its own fat with some more fat. I gotta live up to my French name, you know? All right, so from here, turn off the stove and we're gonna go straight into our oven. It's already preheated at 400. I'm gonna squeeze you guys back. 400 degrees for about 20 minutes. So you reach 160 on the internal temp of the thickest point of the breast. And now we're gonna make crepes. So wipe my knife, set it aside. I'm gonna flip my board just in case anything lands there doesn't get onion juice on it. Perfect. All right, let's make crepes. While I get everything, Cupid, do I have any questions on the chicken? You just read our mind here. We were uh, looking through all the questions and there's some great ones. So a lot of questions on prep. Um, one of our friends here wants to know if the chicken was brined. The chicken, my chicken was brined. Yes. Uh, you don't have to chick, you don't have to brine your chicken if you don't want to. Again, it's an insurance policy, so you get incredibly juicy chicken breasts. I can throw up my uh, chicken brine recipe on my highlights as well, in case you want to go through it. It's also a one to two day process. So again, it depends on how much time you want to invest into your dinner. If you want really good chicken, brine is the way to go. Perfect. And then on the crepes, how long should the batter sit in the fridge before you actually make your crepes? So I wait a day. So I usually make it in the morning. Say I want it for Saturday for breakfast. I make it Friday in the morning. So 24, a full 24 hours is my personal opinion. Love it. And then one last question here, can ghee be used instead of butter? Absolutely. I love ghee. I just don't have any here in the restaurant at the moment. We're still kind of bare bones. Ghee is amazing. It's nutty. It has the, the step right before you get the brown butter. So huge fan of ghee. Perfect. And then uh, when you have time as you're cooking, we have a lot of your she uh, top chef friends here. So whatever you want to share about Top Chef, uh, people want to know if you're going to be watching the new season, what it was like to meet so many chefs from across the country. So I know that that'll be totally entertaining if you want to share some of your adventures with Top Chef. Oh, hi guys. What family? Uh, a lot of people don't know. I'll, I'm going to kind of go back and forth. So I'm going to start with my flour, just explain the process for the crepe batter. I always go dry in the bowl and I add my wet to it. Some people go the opposite. Former pastry chef, this is just how I do it. I put all my dry first in the bowl. And then that's my lemon. You get, honestly, you could do lime, you could do orange. So I'm gonna do actually a little bit of half of a lemon and then I'm gonna do half of the orange that I picked up today at the farmer's market. It's, we're, really spoiled in California for pretty good produce. This is a car car. There we go. All right, so top chef. How much time we got? <laughs> uh, so a lot of people don't know that I actually did Top Chef Mexico before I did Top Chef United States. I did Top Chef Mexico in the fall of 2016. And that shoot was about one and a half times longer or as long as the US one. So I was gone for three months. Uh, that's a really long time for a mother of two to be gone out of her house, but it was incredibly rewarding. 
Golden Remedy Vanilla Paste. You can get this at William Sonoma. The uh, Nielsen Massey Vanilla Paste is probably one of my favorite products besides the extract. That's going to go in, and then I'm going to go in with my wet slowly. Um, yeah, so I went to Mexico City for the first time. I'd only ever, growing up, I spent half my life in uh, Guadalajara, which is a little about four hours, five hours north of Mexico City. And Mexico City changed my life. It was such a rewarding experience. And then I come home, and December 2016, I go come home to work on El Jardín, my project that opened in 2018. And I got a casting call from Top Chef US and they said, hey, you wanna do this? I was like, oh, okay. One of those like answers where you're like saying no, like your head say no, but your mouth is saying yes. And I went and it was an incredible learning experience. Uh, a lot of learning experiences. And the best part of all of that is I left with you know, I can still remember, and I'm, I've never even talked to Joe about this, but I can still remember some of my interviews with uh, Mr. Joe Stasso, Mustachio. I'm going to go on eggs now. Uh, being with my producer, we were kind of producer for our interviews, and it was the same one for me pretty much all season. And I heard telling me about how Joe carried a crystal in his pocket that his girlfriend gave him. And I was just like, oh, this is my person, and obviously. I carry crystals in my bra. This is my person. And just the bonds that I made with very specific humans that I just gravitate towards. I can't explain it. No one can really explain it. Once you do Top Chef, it changes your life and you don't really know why. You don't, you can't explain it. It's uh, a brotherhood, sisterhood like no other. So I would do it again. I was supposed to do All Stars and I took it out because my restaurant was. It was a bad partnership. So it wasn't doing as great as it should have been. And I didn't do it, but maybe five years from now, who knows? All right, now we're gonna strain our crepe batter. You can do this in the blender. I prefer in the blender, but it's for time's, time's sake and noise sake, because it's already really noisy in here. I'm gonna do it in the strainer. I'm just gonna push all the crepe batter through. You don't have to have a fancy strainer like I do. Pods. Yeah, some top stuff. So many. I broke my toe. I broke my toe. I, I, I probably shouldn't say a lot of the stuff we did. Uh, we were kind of the we were the mavericks of top stuff. I'm sure a lot of rules changed after our season. But I broke my toe coming out of a jacuzzi that Melissa, Fozzie, and I were drinking champagne out of because we went to, we were in the Telluride area and we spent all of our per diem buying boobs. That's what's up too. We uh, slipped, I did the split, broke my toe, and then I, we were told we were supposed to do a competition or a challenge the next day, so that was real fun. Yeah, just thinking about it, takes you back. I miss Fati, I miss all of them. Also, weird anecdote, Joe Sasso, I don't know why, you know, I didn't, obviously, we didn't talk about it then, because he lost his mom. His, his mom's name is Claudette. So it was, uh, yeah, him and his girlfriend, Bella, are my people. We did a dinner. He was one of my first uh, guest chefs at El Jardín for our Dia de Muertos dinner. Really special. All right. You strain all that. I will give you a little pro tip. You can do the zest after you strain it, because it obviously will get caught up in the strainer. Uh, but I got enough in there. I may add some more tomorrow morning. I'll make these, I'll use these for staff meal for my cooks and for the hotel staff. Right now we're doing all of our R&D for the property. So we make family meal every single day for all of the management staff that's here just to get us back in that rhythm of cooking for people and seeing people happy. We need more of that right now. All right. Cupid, any other specific cooking questions? We do. So we love that we're um, using everything and being really ecologically friendly. So Kathy wants to know what you're going to do with the leftover chicken parts. So the chicken parts, I'm going to put them in the fridge. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, the chicken parts are actually going to go into, well, 
here at the hotel right now, we're going to use the bones for a bone broth. I do a protein dashi that's kind of the base for a lot of the dishes as long as they're not vegetarian. Uh, so we make this all protein, almost like a ramen broth, super fortified with bones of whatever we have. We're not picky, we just call it protein broth. So if I have beef bones, you know, I, I don't subscribe to a religion of like boxes where things have to be. I make my own rules. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. They're always a lesson somewhere in there, but yeah, but it'll go into a protein broth for sure. And then the legs will go into family meal. We'll barbecue them, we'll go get eaten. Perfect. And then the question which we always get, and you have it right in your hand there, is about the vanilla paste. Um, Donna wants to know if you can use regular vanilla extract instead of vanilla paste. I always say, don't you dare, but what do you think, Claire? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's one of those like dealer's choice, pick your poison. I love vanilla bean. And I understand that I can't, I can't even afford it uh, at my house. I can't afford to buy vanilla beans. They're incredibly expensive. Unless I go to Mexico, then I buy random little facts. If no one knew this, Mexico was actually where the vanilla orchid was found when we were colonized. So uh, the best vanilla in all of Mexico is found in Papantla, Veracruz. Best vanilla where hold me to it uh, but if I can't get vanilla beans from Mexico I use vanilla paste because it still has beans it's made in a kind of a full use full utilization of the bean there's no waste if you you know make use of the scrapings and then it you know all the flavor of vanilla so I have used extract I do use extract I do love seeing those little polka dots everywhere clearly uh, so really there's whatever you have handy, um, clear vanilla. I mean, Christina Tosi of Milk is famous for using clear vanilla extract because it doesn't color the cakes. I'm not going to judge you. So you're good on my book. And then one other question, which we're dying to know too. So when things open up, are you going to be offering live cooking classes at your restaurant? I am. We have this beautiful property. It's actually a small technically for a hotel. 130 rooms, 130 keys, they say in the industry. Um, and we're going to do some really cool activations. We're going to do, I can cook, I can go grill their patios. And a lot of the rooms downstairs are in like the beach view area. So I can take a grill and actually grill with you. We can hang out on the fire pit and um, PDR. So the private dining area also has where I can come and hang out with you guys. Or in the daytime, we'll have activations where through here, you can either sit and watch, you can join. We obviously have this like mile long kitchen line. So we'll have uh, opportunities to do sweet and savory. We're gonna move on. Any other questions right now? Or I can go to the potatoes. I think we're ready to go to the potatoes. Okay, perfect. So I have my little skillet. This is perfect for eggs for one or sauteing something that doesn't take so much surface area on your stove. If you have a smaller stove, you don't have this beautiful Hessen line at home. Heavens. I have a really, my house was built in 1954 and my stove is from 1954. All right, so for your potatoes, papas a la guacaira. First time I had these, I was in Paris. I was cooking dinner for Dia de Muertos at my friend's uh, hotel restaurant, Inca, and it's Peruvian cuisine. So you want a small bite on this, by the way. Uh, and I tried them for the first time. I've never been to Peru. I've never had Peruvian food. And I thought they were one of the most delicious things I'd ever tasted. And this is why I'm making it for you on Lover's Day. So you get your onion, quarter onion, garlic, same. Sorry, it's married with my chipotle here. You have your onion, garlic, your chipotle and adobo. It could be dry chipotle if you don't, if you have, you know, not the, have it slip off your board onto the floor. Sorry guys. It's okay, no one's eating this, just me. Uh, if you don't want a lot of spice, obviously omit the chipotle if it's not do or die. You can use uh, paprika in there if you just want like flavors, spices. You can use spice blends if you don't want straight chilies. Serranos if you want fresh chilies. Again, no one's judging you. Do whatever is right for you. And 
I like it spicy. So I will do, I'm doing the three chipotles. The recipe calls for two to three. We're going to put in our onions, put in the garlic, and we're going to add the chipotle peppers as well. I'm just going to marry it all together until they get nice and soft. And this is one of the easiest sauces ever. It can be room temperature even. I've had it room temperature and the potatoes are hot. Make sure, like I said earlier, control your heat. You don't want to get it too hot and burn everything. And nothing worse than burn garlic. Oh, I'm sure there's things worse, but you don't want to eat it. Okay, Claudette, we've got a, a ton of questions coming in, so we'll take you through a couple of them. Erin wants to know when your restaurant's going to be officially open for business. Oh, Erin. <laughs> If I tell you, I have to kill you. No, I'm just playing. Um, it's a million dollar question. We were supposed to open in New Year's, that didn't happen. We were supposed to open in January, that didn't happen. February, that's not happening. Uh, we're looking at mid-March to guests only for the hotel guests that are here to have a sneak preview of what the restaurant will look like. We're actually calling it Vaguita, which is like the little sister and a tribute to the uh, endangered whale. Uh, but to the public, mid-March, that's all I can think of. I'll really know. Awesome. And then we have a coming in about the cookware. Uh, can okay. you know what size is the skillet that you're using right now? I think it's, is it an eight or a 10? It, this is an eight. Great. Um, Sarah has a question about the Nanobond. She said that obviously you reference it as being non-stick, um, but it doesn't look non-stick. So is there right. a share about the technology? Yeah, so the technology, it is handed to Heston. It is one of those proprietary blends type of thing. And I wish I knew exactly how it was made, and then I'd be a very rich woman. Uh, so it isn't, I mean, you can, people associate non-stick with this guy. Uh, so it is like a quick release. I don't think it is, it can be called non-stick unless it has like a Teflon. I'm sure that is. I don't know, how much, how much, I don't know. but it doesn't, nothing sticks to it, I swear. Uh, and you'll see right now, I'm gonna provide you need this pan for the actual potatoes. So it's gonna be a kind of a wipe and you'll see exactly what I mean when I say it's nothing sticks to it. And right now I'm picking up, I put that evaporated milk and I know it sounds weird, do it. I didn't question it and it was delicious. Uh, and I'm just picking up all those drippings from the sauteed onion and garlic. And you'll see when I wipe my towel through it, what I mean by I'm not stick. It really is releasing whatever's in there. It does come off incredibly easily. So I'm sure they are, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering how they do it. And it's pretty cool to be the first people to do something as kind of badass as this. This is something like, I love that my kids like it because, and this is like, swear not off of a script. I love that my kids like it because this will go to them. This is for me, if I were as a chef, this is the new cast iron, you know, in the deep south that, you know, generational cookware. This is definitely something that you invest in and your entire family can benefit from it. And then one more question, uh, actually two more questions. Pamela Stafford wants to know what your go-to recipe is for a weeknight dinner, because this, this is an ambitious dinner. So what is like that, the typical weeknight? Uh, and then SB wants to know if you had an opportunity to do Top Chef again, would you do it? All right, Pamela. My weekday, well, I have teenagers. I have a 15 year old. They are on this weird I started working out about three four years ago like pretty religiously uh took my life back uh, stopped drinking all that good stuff that you have to do as you grow up and realize that some patterns aren't as healthy as others and my kids have taken to kind of this quote-unquote meathead approach to life and they really love chicken and rice so I make my famous butter chicken or butter rice butter garlic rice also on Instagram you can find the recipe on my reels and I love to grill. So I grill out as often as I can, a bunch of veggies, chicken thighs always marinated with 
I'm sure you guys have seen in the grocery store, there are those like herbs, it's herbs, aromatic. Sometimes it's like ginger paste and like a toothpaste kind of look. That is my favorite cheat to making dinner really, really fast and very flavorful. So I use, you know, I use chipotle de adobo, I use soy sauce, fish sauce. I grab a bunch of veggies, cilantro, a lot of herbs, and that little toothpaste of ginger, or they have one that's like a Thai blend. That's my favorite dinner. Just really good chicken, grilled, veggies grilled with just lime and salt, and my butter garlic rice. And it's not ambitious, I swear. It's 15 minutes to the table. If I, I turn the grill on, and again, this is the chef way, I turn the grill on while I do my rice, and then I could ping pong back and forth. Work. All right, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm gonna ask anyway, um, because I think you're totally gonna have a moment. Um, Adam wants to know who your favorite Peloton instructor is. <laughs> oh, you know, so I'll answer, sorry, I missed the top step question. I'll get back to that. Robin, Robin Arzone is a baddie. I've been pregnant twice. It did not look like her and bless her heart. She is a badass. All right, so I'm going to go away from the camera so I can go over my sink, but I'm going to put this guy in my blender, everything in it. All right, and then I'm going to, I'm right here, guys, I'm right here. So to answer the Top Chef question, Top Chef, yes, I would do it again. Absolutely, I, I just needed time. It was one of those things that, you know, when I, when I got asked to do it again, I wasn't ready. I, uh, Top Chef, the way I looked at it, I said, you know, Top Chef, I just did season 15. Why would I do season 17? I need to, I still had a little bit of Stockholm syndrome if I'm gonna be completely honest. And now I would, you know, maybe the next All-Stars, who knows? But it's definitely really good for us as chefs to get out of our comfort zone, to do something that is, I mean, literally out of your comfort zone. There are things that we can prepare for in life, especially in this career. There is literally nothing that can prepare you for Top Chef. Because the second they say go, your brain goes and you just hear it fall to your stomach. You don't know what the fuck you're doing. Sorry, Jim F, F bomb there. But yeah, so I would do it again. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And it makes lifelong friends. And it's always a good story, always. All right, so I have my blend going wiping off my hand so you guys can see what I'm talking about on the non-stick part. Not really have to be super tedious to it, but that is wiped. I'm going to put a dry towel to it. And this isn't with soap. I didn't use a scrub. This is just a towel. And this is like a rough clean. So when I say non-stick, it's not Teflon. This is Pretty nonstick if you ask me, especially for having a dairy product have to that. Yeah, pretty badass. All right, so we're gonna make the gaqueta. I'm gonna pause there, finish this, guys, show you guys what I'm doing. Sorry, I got distracted with the Robin Arzon fan grill. For your sauce, the papa la vacaina sauce is this, the potato, or sorry, the uh, onions, the evaporated milk, the potato, the garlic. You have your stale bread one slice, two slices, it's the thickener. So if you want it, if you blend this and see how it's a little loose, you want it tighter, you want more of that like aioli texture, just add a little bit more bread. You can add tortilla chips if you are food free. That's my good like cheat if you want food free. And queso fresco, if you don't have queso fresco where you're at near you, farmer's cheese works really well. Goat cheese would be tasty in here too. Pop that in. And you have a little bit of salt uh, in the cheese. So I always, on this sauce, I'll just wait until everything is blended together, the flavors vary together, and then I'll season to taste. So I'm a big proponent of seasoning to taste. Everyone has their taste buds. I grew up eating a lot of salt in the Northern regions of Mexico. We eat a lot of salt, a lot of acid, set lime, big, big addition to our food. So season to taste. And blitz that, and by the, magic of television. I'll show you what it looks like at the end. Before we go on to the gaqueta for the crease. All right, so 
here is my sauce that I made earlier. And it kind of looks like a Romanesco or like that kind of Velveeta y texture, if that's a good reference point for some of you. And it doesn't have to be hot. This can be at room temperature. Your potatoes are going to be really hot. And I'll show you guys how to plate that at the end. So for like that head back. For time's sake, if you guys are cooking along with me, right now is where you can put your heavy cream and your piloncillo or brown sugar, whatever you'd like. I prefer piloncillo. I really like that molasses quality that it has, that the mineral quality that piloncillo has, which is unrefined sugar cane juice that's produced uh, and used in lots of different cuisines. So here I already have it reduced, just those two things and a stick of cinnamon. I like the cajeta flavor. So this isn't goat milk, which is most common. Uh, but if you don't want cinnamon, you can do cardamom would be beautiful. Uh, ginger powder, never raw ginger. Ginger, raw ginger and dairy do not like each other. It will curdle your cream and you'll make cheese. Uh, if you want ginger flavor, I would go with dry or you wait to add the actual ginger until it's really, really well reduced. So I have it reduced. I'll show you guys the spoon. Almost there. Almost where I want it, but I'm going to keep reducing it and then I'm going to um, mount my butter into it and marry that together and then it'll get even further reduced and nice and shiny and become like a toffee sauce. So you guys can see the color. Obviously, if you guys are cooking right now, you'll see the color. And it is still, it's thick, but it still has a little bit of reduction that could happen here. So we're just gonna throw that into the middle and I can make my, I can make my uh, crepe stomachs here. Kind of a low heat. Keep your whisk candy, add the butter. And the recipe says spiked. I'm gonna move my board. I'm done with it. The recipe says spiked. The reason why is because normally cajeta at least where I'm from, Guadalajara, is embinada, which means with wine. And you could add wine, you could add tequila. It's really, really good with a little splash of tequila at the end. Uh, but I'm spiking it with a banana vinegar. It could be pineapple vinegar, it could be champagne vinegar, or you could just use white wine. Totally fine. But that does add it at the very end. I just a little splash for that acidity. You want food to have balance. You want salt, always season your sweet stuff with a little pinch of salt. Everything just kind of becomes really mature at that point. People always say that salty is a bad thing when you're a person. It's delicious with salt, so I'm delicious too. Right. So you guys can see the, what's happening. It's already boiling, obviously, because I have some sweet. Uh, but we're gonna just keep reducing it, keep adding the butter all of this is in. Almost there. Any questions, Cupid? Yeah, we've got a couple coming in. Um, a lot of people are asking about cleaning Heston pans, all of that good information. We did drop a little article um, in the chat box that was a very recent one from Bon Appetit that talks about the durability and the cleaning. So definitely recommend that as um, nighttime reading material after everyone's done with the class. Um, on Valentine's Day. Yeah, or on Valentine's Day for all the single people, all the single people out there. Um, <laughs> I want to know, since you are so athletic, uh, do you have any go-to power breakfasts that get you started uh, on your day? Uh, I am, I am a 80-year-old woman at heart and I love oatmeal so much. And so I always tend to stick to really light breakfast. I don't like heavy breakfast, uh, never have. I used to be that, you know, coffee and a piece of toast was my breakfast, but I realized that I had kind of this drop off of caffeine. So a really good bowl of oatmeal with a ton of fruit, berries, whatever you have handy. I love apples, like really cold apples and warm oatmeal is really does it for me. And I do a protein shake about every, you know, I'm not going to say like every day because I don't, I sometimes forget, uh, but I try to do at least a protein shake with my oatmeal. I normally work out at night, which is also probably frowned upon by some people that say endorphins, but I actually sleep really good after I work out. 
um, yeah, so I say oatmeal and a piece of toast with some fruit and kind of fuels me for the day. Not kind of, really does. Awesome. And then I love this question as well, because we all at some point are going to come to San Diego to visit you at your new space. So um, this question is about the best grocery store uh, to buy things that you spoke about, like the um, all of the different ingredients that are special to your dish that might be a little bit trickier to find. Okay. So if you're looking for Piloncillo, I would head to in San Diego or really any area, a Mexican grocery store, Mexican market, bodegas, they're in every... I've cooked in every corner of the United States, and I promise you, I've found all of my ingredients across. Uh, if you're looking for vanilla paste, that might be a little trickier. WilliamSonoma.com, they have it. Great resource. Uh, but a lot of things, no matter where you are, I do cooking classes off my website, or not right now because of the hotel, but I was doing them when um, all the lockdowns happened, started. And everyone was able to find everything online. So it's really, if you want it in a pinch, look for the Mexican grocery stores for the Piloncillo. But obviously, don't kind of limit yourself with saying, no, I don't have this, I can't make it. Find a substitution. If I were to substitute Piloncillo, I would go dark brown sugar. That is the closest. Uh, if I didn't have chipotle al adobo, then just use a fresh serrano. Omit the chili. Uh, you can find sometimes aji amarillo, which is very Peruvian, at I found it in Bonds and like the regular Kroger grocery store. That is completely okay. And if you can't find all of it, I promise you can still make a really tasty just dish, just with the garlic, the onions, and the queso fresco, which farmer's cheese, goat's cheese, that substitution is fairly easy. Uh, don't limit yourself that you can't do something because you can't find an ingredient. There's always substitutions, and we're always here. One of my favorite parts is becoming, you know, a Women's Sonoma Chef Collective alumni or obviously the still, we're still in it. Uh, it is a really big treat for me to tell people how to like remove the veil from chefs and how approachable food is. You just kind of have to be very instinctual. So don't, don't feel like we are, we know more than you. I promise you, half of us are completely winging it most of the time. And it works for us. And then we're all going to be collectively jealous of Kitty in the chat who said that she just ordered the 14 inch nano bond walk, which is an amazing piece. So if you were Kitty and you were just getting this walk, what would be the first thing that you'd make in it? Oh, so I would make, I have this, actually we're testing a bunch of recipes. I don't have the walk, but um, I would make my salt and pepper chicken wings. So I start off with this like fish sauce glaze with a ton a ton a ton of aromatics, so onion, garlic, fish sauce, and make this caramel with a little bit of sugar in there and just really bump up the herbs. Uh, a lot of cilantro, um, any green onion, seriously, anything under the face there, I can just fry the hell out of it in the bottom of the wok. Just keep moving everything around, get that oil really, really flavored. Then drop in chicken wings. And I am a huge fan of chicken wings. My kids eat them regularly from our favorite Chinese restaurant and uh, salt and pepper at the end. So that's what I would make from my walk. And then, or that same exact base of that chili herbs flavor oil and drop a bucket of noodles in it and then finish with raw cabbage, raw vegetables, raw cabbage, uh, bok choy, daikon radish, just a lot of textures. I love textures and finish with a ton of lime juice and a splash of tamari or smoked tamari. I promise this, uh, all this sounds really chefy, but it's super easy. All right. Where's my big batter? But uh, now I want the wall. Let's check on our chicken. All right. Chicken looks good. So we're going to take it out. I'll even temp it for you guys. Usually I can touch and feel. The temperature is if I can get this open, but I'll show you guys very carefully. Beautiful color. We're gonna go right in the thickest part of the chicken breast. Drop the angle thermometer, and then I'm just gonna set, leave it alone. And then take the 
back of the stove. So we've got to rest anyways. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Ignore it. I'm going to drop in the butter. Almost there. I'm going to drop in the butter while it's resting. I'm going to baste it a little bit. Hi, I'm baby climb. I'm going to drop the butter in on top. Have it run in the pan, all those juices to get married with that butter. And you're like, that's a lot of butter. It is. It's also no one's judging you for your butter use. This is why, this is why we have wait, why we have Robin. This is why I have Robin in my life. I love butter. Drop that butter and then the miso this recipe called for miso this is the umami chicken right so that miso that miso paste fermented miso bean soybean paste and we're just gonna mix all those flavors marry that miso sauce is nice and dissolved all together and really it's just a spoon like it doesn't require any other pans any other special equipment and you just Pour all of that butter right over everything. I'm actually shy, a little shy of 160. So I'm gonna drop it back in the oven for about five more minutes. Like that. But again, well, you might as well have it based with all these flavors. Like that. That really looks like love, right? That's love in a pan. I think everyone now more than ever really goes gravitates towards uh, that heartfelt feeling you get when you have really like soulful food. I love hot sauce. So I'm going to drizzle with my salsa matcha. It doesn't mean you're going to drink this butter. I promise it seems like a lot, but you want to bake. So how would you do this if you didn't add all that beautiful butter? That in. And work on our crates. All right. Any other questions yet? Yeah. Where I go, crates? We do. So, with the restaurant opening, we want to know if there's a signature dish to your restaurant. Like somebody comes in, asks what the must have thing is on the menu, and you would say it's this thing. Not yet. It's still, you know, I feel restaurants, I'm kind of really hippie in the sense of how I view food and my industry and what I do, um, I find restaurants to have personalities. Every restaurant, you can, if you go and eat out a lot, you know what one restaurant versus another one, how they're different, how the experience is different. One's kind of like that clubby vibe and then the other one is that hole in the wall, kind of dimly lit. I still haven't figured out what Baga is. Uh, El Jardin, I knew what El Jardin was. I could tell you what you wanted to come and sit and eat. Usually it was a Oaxaca chicken. Um, but it's too soon to tell. I don't want to rush the restaurant to fit into what I think and my biases. I want it to tell me what it wants to be. And it sounds super hippie, but I'm super hippie. So we'll see. Maybe, maybe when you come, well, who asked that question, Casey? Oh, that was one of mine, actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, when you come, hopefully I'll have an answer for you. Awesome. We'll just order one of everything and then we can figure out then, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have a room, so <laughs> grab on, bring your stretchy pants, and we'll figure it out together. Hey, who travels without their stretchy pants? I certainly <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So we're going to go to crates now. Crates down. Recap, chicken is in, going for another five minutes. We have our cajeta, we added the butter. We have not added the vinegar yet and the miso, that's gonna go at the end. We have our potato sauce made. We're gonna crisp up the potatoes right as soon as we finish doing the first demo crepe, because I have crepes made, magic and television. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to make a crepe so you feel empowered and so you know that we all struggle with the same ugly crepe when you start. That's fine. You just have to get used to the, the motion of what your wrist does, what the pan does. You have a little bit of insurance with this one actually being nonstick. You can do it on the nanobond, completely acceptable. It does release 
but I just wanted to show you guys differences in the equipment that is available on the Hessen Home line. Like this is a perfectly beautiful crate van. You don't have to get any special equipment. You don't have to get the, the you know, wood paddle, none of that. We're gonna make it work. All right, I have my butter. I like brushing it with butter. You can use sand spray, you can use coconut oil if you want to. Um, you don't want it too hot. This is the exception because we're not searing anything, right? We want that crepe to be very delicious and light and have a little structure. I got second place in our top chef crepe uh, competition that we got woken up by Padma that day. Joe got third. We're both big crepe lovers, but I beat him. Even though he's got way more tricks in his bag than I do. But this is my favorite thing. I beat Joe Sasso on making crepes once. Okay. Sorry, Joe, if you're watching. I love you. We're just going to brush the bottom of the pan all over. Doesn't, again, this is a lot of butter. It's fine. You can call, call me when you need to because you have high cholesterol. I'll console you. I'll tell you that it's okay. Make sure their heat is low. This is a slightly different than a home stove, but if I was at my house, it has the dial with the numbers on it. So go to the two to three range. So you get the, the hang of what your wrist wants to do. Your batter the next day. Let's do a little comparison. I want to show you the difference. It even changes colors. So this is pretty thick. If you were to make a Crepe from this, you would have a very dense crepe. You would have almost slightly thin pancakes for all my Talladega Nights fans. I'll never say crepe. Then the next day, that gluten relaxes. And that is, I haven't added any liquid. That is that texture you want. This would make a really bad pancake, a really great crepe. This is a two ounce ladle. Some pans, if you have anything bigger than this, so if you have your eight inch, this is a 12 inch saute pan. Um, if you have anything smaller, if you have a 10 inch, I would do a little shy of two ounces, so just not as full of a ladle scoop. And then I hold it at an angle. Right, I'm always, always turning. When you make crates, never stop turning. Right in the center. And you're just gonna go. Just gonna go. When I first learned how to bake crates, they told me the first one goes to the dogs. There is some sort of French idiom. And it's true, the first one's ugly. The ugly baby. Also, amazing band name, amazing restaurant in Brooklyn, ugly baby. So fun that I didn't come up with that first. And then, so like I said, first one goes to the dogs. It's not the beautiful, like smooth crepe, but again, no one's gonna know. My favorite, like little real uh, sound effect. No one's gonna know. They're gonna know. No one's gonna know. They're gonna know. And then you wait about two minutes, three minutes, and you flip. A lot of conviction. You really gotta. You gotta believe in yourself more because the crepe will call you out on your bluff and it will fall apart. So we're gonna wait a little bit longer. You'll start to see a little bit of the coloration on the edges and that's when you know to flip. You don't want it to have too much color. You want it to stay pretty blonde. And that you can hold on to it. Also random, if you let your pancake or your you let your crepe batter sit, it actually does become stronger because that boom was tight when it was fresh and then it relaxes, but it doesn't forget. It has that like instinctual muscle memory that gluten has and it will stay pretty firm. So see that, flip it. It's not the same as an egg crisp. I promise you can't do that. It's really hard. I tried it, I failed. But again, I have some made. So when you're making these at home, flip it a minute and then just flip it over onto parchment, onto a baking sheet, whatever you have near you, nothing sticks. I'm just gonna dig one more so you guys can see. 
And you'll see even all these, you know, little rough edges when we played it. I mean, you'll not know. It's fine. And then we'll see all those little imperfections. I learned a word a few years ago and it became one of my favorite words in Japanese. It's wabi sabi. It's perfectly unperfect. That's my gang name. I'm a wabi sabi. You see this one? Oh. Ah. <laughs> Know what I'm doing. Second try. First one. Not so good. Now we wait. Any questions? Yeah. So you're gonna love all of the people in the chat right now because everybody wants to talk about butter, which is like one of our favorite topics. So um, Kitty asks a kind of a ridiculous question. Question, which is, is there any sub for the butter? <laughs> I don't think there is a sub for the butter, right? Is it Kitty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do we need to talk about this? Like, what does butter do to you? Are you okay? I'm okay. Um, there's, for butter, butter has so much beautiful flavor. It has, if you get really good quality butter, my favorite is Vermont Creamery salted butter. I'm a big proponent of salted butter, uh, but it's got so much personality and it lends itself to really become part of the food and become part of the dish. If you really do not want to add butter to say the pan, the crepes, coconut oil is, works great. It has a high smoke point. Uh, where else is there? Oh, there's a lot of butter everywhere. Um, for the chicken, I'm going to pull it out while it let it rest again. For the chicken, uh, I'm going to say, I would say no. Um, you can do vegetable oil, but you won't have any of the flavor. Coconut oil wouldn't, maybe. Oh my, oh, I don't know why I judge. Coconut oil. Well, here's right? With our Heston pans, they're very nonstick. So yeah. if you're using less butter probably on the base of the pan and whatever you're adding would be more, you know, for flavor or stuff on top. So you're, maybe we'll say that you're saving butter on the bottom and you're adding it else, somewhere else, which is maybe conservation, hopefully. Absolutely. This is strictly for flavor. This. But, I mean, even the butter, when I brush it on, you can see that it's got a bunch of like kind of holes in between the brushes because it doesn't go on in one layer. It's only to flavor the crepe. See that the, the little edges are there. I have to use both hands so I don't rip it and I pop it here. So yeah, this is flavor, flavor, flavor. I like to layer my flavors. I don't think if you start with oil and then you add butter, that's okay, but I don't think if you omit it, you'll end up with the same result as I get. So I always want to be 100% transparent, and this is how I would cook at home. This is how I would cook in my restaurant. If you have an aversion to butter, for, by all means, try something else. Try coconut oil. That's what you're used to. It's like if you want to sub the dairy, try almond milk. If it comes out weird, don't blame me. I didn't use it. But now you know. So I'm going to, done with my crepes, so I'm going to get to the side. We're gonna wait now that this is all done for our plate up. And we're gonna finish with our potatoes. We're done, guys. Thank you for being patient. This is ambitious. Three recipes in an hour. It's really hard. But we're almost there. We're just five minutes over. This won't take long, I promise. We're gonna do our potatoes for our papas a la guacaina. My favorite way of making potatoes is that crush method with my oil. method. You can do these in the oven. I'm going to start them up here and then drop them in the oven. And I just boil these potatoes, just like in the recipe, it says boil for tender, then you're going to smash them. I like to smash them with my hands. I like to dance a little, put the music on, get, you know, get myself in the mindset of cooking and just smash it. Take part of your palm. On all of these. If you're making the recipe calls for a pound. If you're making it for two people, that's a good amount of potatoes. You can always boil these, mash these, put them in the fridge, and like that can be part of your meal prep. All of this is really good meal prep if you want to make it a day ahead. Please, by all means, do it. If you have any questions uh, on Sunday, I don't have a Valentine. Take you my Valentine. It's stupid. Uh, I have nothing going on, so I will answer your questions. All right, so let's see here. We've got a great question from Christine. This is fun. So if you had to make this dinner for any celebrity couple, who would you want to make it for? 
a four. And you can't name Robin again. We're taking Robin out of the mix. Beyonce and Davey. Oh, yeah. Okay, I love it. And then you do get the award for the most dishes ever made in what 65 minutes. We're all blown away here. Um, and then Lewis wants to know, can you prepare the crepes the night before? Yes, absolutely. So let me I'll answer that right now. We're gonna put the potatoes. I just stirred it really quick and I'm gonna drop them in the oven. Let that go. Turn this guy off. Yes, you can prep actually all of this except for the chicken. Since you're making your chicken brine a day, oh, you know, you're, you're going to fry your chicken. You have that chicken in a day before. Obviously, that's a little bit of a head start. All of this can be done ahead. Uh, I'll finish the back. What else? Um, Someone wants to know if Javier Placencia will be joining you uh, for a guest chef appearance at some point. You will. And actually, for whoever asked uh, the chef demos, we'll actually also be doing a, <laughs> we're going to do a surf with the chef. So Javier is an avid surfer. He's got a restaurant in Todos Santos, uh, Baja California Sur. If you've ever been to Todos Santos, you know the surf is amazing. One of the menus here on property is based on the kind of endless summer road trip that you would take from San Diego to Todos Santos. And he is a big inspiration in that. He uh, is one of my mentors, my big brother, and Negro, he is definitely coming to cook with me. Yeah, he cooks with me at El Jardín too. For those wondering, I just added the miso to the caqueta and I'm gonna add the splash of my banana vinegar. Again, it can be tequila, it can be champagne, it can be any other vinegar you want. And then I know we're all staring at these dishes, wishing that we were eating them, but at some point these pans are going to get cleaned. Uh, yes. What would you tell us in terms of advice about how to clean Heston Nanobond? I don't like using anything abrasive on my pans at home. I will say this is something that every cook at home does, myself included, before I really started thinking about how I clean things. Um, no one cleans the bottom of their pans. So I will say, when you are cleaning your pan, use something non-abrasive for the inside. Don't try to use this like stainless steel Brillo pads. It already does a lot of, it, it gets you there by being incredibly non-stick without being Teflon. Um, so you don't have to really go in with that like hard muscle. Uh, light soak, always soak your pan. All of this will go into warm water. I will finish cleaning the kitchen before I go back to my pan. A uh, sponge will just a good wipe. And if I were to scrub any part, I would scrub the bottom of it. Heston has an amazing cleaning solution that keeps that stainless, that beautiful sheen. It doesn't have any like water spots. You just give it a wipe with that cleaning solution. And I swear, I don't tend to buy stuff like that. When I used it, I was like, it's one of those like just shut up and use it i don't question it i don't make pans for a living i make food the food comes out delicious in these pans and they also look beautiful with the cleaning solution that heston provides so that's a great way to clean it all right before i answer another question i'm just going to show you guys how i finish the majority of my protein dishes a lot of lime juice it counterbalances all of that like butteriness by a pop of acidity can't go wrong with all of your dishes should always be finished with a touch of acid, whether it's lime, Mexican, sometimes I just can't help myself, um, or it, it could be a splash of vinegar, sherry vinegar would be great in that. And I'm just gonna baste it. One last time, go to the bottom of the pan, you kind of tilt the pan and wear a little promo, tilt the pan and then all that juice back up there. I'm not even moving the onions. I'm going to leave them there and we're going to plate now. We're done, guys. We're done. Any other questions? Oh, my sushi. We're going to have a field day with this. Yeah, we have, we have kind of a question or comment moment. So obviously you've had a banner year. Um, it's just been one success after another and we were so thrilled for you. Um, can you tell us about like your most exciting, most proud moment in cooking? and then maybe a more humbling experience where something just didn't quite work out for you. 
my proudest moment was getting the cover of Food and Wine magazine. Um, after doing this for a really long time, it was one of those uh, affirmations that I was, and it was tacos de vidia, which I eat at the market in Tijuana. So that was definitely one of those affirmations that I was on the right path. I was doing what I was doing. I'm in my purpose, which is to talk about Mexico in a different context that everyone in the States knows it for. Um, talk about myself, talk about what it is growing up in the border region with so many different cultures uh, becoming who I am. You know, look at me. I don't look like what people perceive, you know, a Mexican woman to look like. And that's okay. It's okay. So everyone comes in different shapes, sizes, and appearances. And breaking the norm is one of my proudest moments through the food and wine cover. And I got to wear a Misfits t-shirt, a leather jacket with Mexicana written on the back, and my Doc Martens in plaid pants because Gwen Stefani forever. Yeah, that was my proudest moment. My not proudest moment was being so visceral uh, on national television and not have not realizing that you get more when you get more beads of honey or all those all those things that it's hard to come across myself if I don't check in with myself. That was my not proudest moment. Yeah, I'm always checking in with myself now. Love that. And then one final comment question, um, which I know is a topic that's very near and dear to you. So obviously the proceeds from tonight's event all go to No Kid Hungry and their fight to end childhood hunger in America. Their cause is spectacular. And William Sonoma has supported them for over 10 years. Can you share a little bit about, I know you've done a lot of things for hunger locally. Can you share a little bit about your passion for No Kid Hungry? Yes. So going back to another story time, I, this probably requires a little bit more of attention. So everything's done. The potatoes will come out right now. So we'll talk about my connection with milk and hungry and kids hungry in general. So I am, so there I was, 2003, with a mother at 18 years old with this little boy. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I was ill-equipped in a lot of different ways to raise a child. Uh, the biggest way I was ill-equipped was I didn't have a career. I was 18 years old, just graduated high school. I had no idea what the hell was doing. And then fast forward to 2005, I find myself a single mother of two um, very humbling moments. I've worked many a job. I have uh, been a bookkeeper for a nonprofit. I have worked as, uh, as a check cashing clerk in the daytime while I was a cook at night. I have worked in the IKEA returns department. Every job I've done at the time to pay my way to keep a roof over our heads and my kids clothes. Um, I've been on welfare, I've been on food stamps, I've been on WIC. Uh, I've had those moments where I was incredibly embarrassed to have my WIC coupons and then get a little emotional. And in 2016, I went and did Top Chef Mexico, like I mentioned. One of the challenges was to go to these orphanages that the Mexican government sets up across the entire country uh, to take in uh, displaced youth. Usually it is parents that cannot afford to have them. So they kind of give them up to, the, they, they become a warden of the state uh, or of the country in Mexico. Um, and these houses are called aldeas and they are set up with uh, a mother Ten, so to speak. They can be an aunt, they can be to someone that already had kids and uh, wants to help other kids. And the house has usually 10 children to one woman that runs the household, which is kind of like the sorority mom, so to speak. And they are given 50 pesos a day, a day for the entire household for three meals. And they are to give them a nutritious meal at every meal period. Imagine that. 50 pesos, which is about $3, could you survive off that? And one of the challenges was on Top Chef Mexico, we, we didn't go to our grocery stores for our challenges. We actually went into the markets that everyone else goes to. Here I am, this woman that has already gone through enough shit in her life. I have to start begging for food for this family that I'm cooking on television for. And that really sparked this need to kind of go back and remember what it felt like to be hungry, remember what it felt like to have your kids look at you and say, I want that candy. And I say, I can't buy it. I, to, my, to this day, my son remembers the times where he wanted something sweet. And I was like, all I have is milk, my mini wheats coupon, my cheese coupon, and that's all we can get. Um, 
So back to No Kid Hungry, I spent several years of my career really focused on paying it forward in Mexico and making sure that I was seeing people. I was seeing these children and that I was doing at least my part. I can't do it all. I can't save the world, but I can do my part um, in the organizations that I am in partner with. And No Kid Hungry, when I came back to open El Jardín, I said, let's go to our backyard. I ask everyone in this class, whoever is still on it, whoever is dropped off, maybe they'll get, when they get the recording, they'll hear me say this. I get asked often, how do you invoke change in your communities? All you can do is you. So all you can do is look around and see the need in your community. I can go to Vaughn's down the street from my house and see a little kid on the skateboard in front of the Domino's Pizza and the look in his face. I'm incredibly empathic. I'm incredibly like I'm that mother nature part of me knows that kid is hungry, knows that their parents are trying to do as hard as job as they can to keep shit together, especially nowadays. Uh, but it really was like, look within our community and see the kids that are hungry. See right now that they're not going to school. How are they getting hot meals? Family meal in my restaurants is incredibly important because I also know that this lifestyle is one of go, 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 because you're working multiple jobs to make ends meet. And hot meals are a hot commodity. Like you just don't have them. You're always on your feet. You don't eat. So I, like no cook hungry is also a big part of my life. So No Kid Hungry really closed that loop on working on our own backyards, working in the States and seeing how us being this great nation that we are, have very hungry kids in our neighborhoods, in our backyard. So that was a really long answer. Thank you for being patient with the plate up, but I had to go, I had to get in there. I had to look at you guys and tell you guys how important that cause is. Well, we should have sent everyone some tissues. I'm sorry that we did <laughs> on your own for the tissues. I've got mine over here, but Plata, it's amazing. All that you've done for children across America is truly incredible. And you should be so proud of all of your work with No Kid Hungry, just amazing. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna plate these potatoes have been in the oven through my chat. I just did a little bit of olive oil. I did season the chicken with a little bit of salt at the end. Remember, whenever you're adding miso, it is a fermented paste. It has salt, so to taste it before you add your salt. And I will just a little pinch of salt on the potatoes. And we're gonna plate them. And this is how I would plate it on Valentine's Day. It, I always love a family style affair when it comes to uh, eating. I want everyone to get in there. I want best part of family style cooking is you gotta put your cell phone down because you gotta look at someone in the eyes as they're handing you the plate so it doesn't fall on the ground. So I I plate that same way. I'm gonna toss it and make sure I have my sauce. Up there. Big plate, this is a 12 inch wood board, sufficient. I'm just gonna land with the sauce right on the corner. Nothing fancy. Come on, judging you. I'm not. I'm sure your partner won't say, Ugh, that plating, please get out of here. Potatoes right on top of that. I love these like baby potatoes, these kiwis that are different colors. You eat with your eyes. You might as well have it look really beautiful. Remember, your eyes eat before your stomach does. Give it that height. That drama, that is what everyone wants. That's what everyone's there for, the drama. And we're gonna grab our, so I'll tell you guys why I did the chicken breast the way I did. See if I can do this without dropping everything. It's in the shape of a heart. Oh, and I'm single. Anyone? Holler. So. All right, chicken. I'm gonna chicken the opposite way. I just changed that up on myself. Prop up with the potatoes a little bit. Oh, look at that. It's like I'm a chef or something. I'm gonna drizzle some of that butter, miso, onion, chicken love right over. You can drop a little bit over the potatoes. No one can know. Everyone thinks it's delicious. And I'm gonna add a little bit of chili oil. Again, all of these things are the way I like to eat, the way I want to taste my food. So if you don't wanna add more chili oil, 
do you, boo boo? I'm gonna finish it with a little bit of cilantro. It can be a garnish. If you don't have cilantro, that's okay too. Nothing fancy here either. You're not gonna grab tweezers. You're just gonna give it, have it drop where it drops. But those little pops, remember all that butter, why we added lime is we want that freshness of the acid. Why we want cilantro, we want that herbaceous freshness too. That is always welcome in food. Here's your main course. Some chicken. Papas. And we're gonna go dessert. I'll take pictures of all this so you guys can see how I plated it. The crepes. Crepes are very simple. You can just eat them. I swear, I would be a very happy girl if I grabbed a crepe and just dumped it in the sauce. That would make me very happy. But we'll try to be a little, a little more fancy for you guys. Take my spoon off. Any questions so far? No, everyone's just over here crying with you about the no, <laughs> no get hungry story. <laughs> We really love you. Uh, thank you. I love you guys too. Thank you guys for hanging in with me. We are all done. I'm just going to show you how to, how to add a little drama to your Valentine's Day. I like a good helping of the sauce on the bottom of your pan or your plate. Sorry. And then normally you'll see crepes folded. Also, when you get warm, you don't have to warm the crepes because the sauce is warm. It can be room temperature. Crepes are delicious room temperature. If you would try to keep this up, you will either crisp it or it will get cold very fast because it's so thin. So I just don't worry about it too much. It's delicious. You can fold it in quarters like this and end up with this little triangle thing, or you can just let it be like organic. That. Again, if we're, if you have a chef teaching you how to make Valentine's Day, things like a chef, then wing it. I'm just gonna do three, maybe four. One more. This again, definitely we can make it ahead of time. All right, four down. I have some, your toppings are up to you. You have the caqueta, it's already beautiful. If you have strawberries where you're at, do strawberries. These are strawberries that we just cut up from the farmer's market today. I put in a little bit of orange juice, a little bit of uh, just granulated sugar and some vanilla bean paste. So they're just macerated for a few hours. I'm just gonna drop them wherever they land. I promise you'll impress people just by making crepes. So if it's your first date on Valentine's Day, A, brave. B, you'll really, really shine on this one. And have some whipped cream. Now the whipped cream, I have so much flavor and sugar everywhere else. This is just whipped cream. It can be coconut cream. We're just gonna plop it on top. And then I'm just gonna drizzle a little bit more. Dessert for two on one plate. I think it's super sexy. I think you'll be a hero on Valentine's Day. Great. This creates a la Claudette. Suzette doesn't get to get all the fun. All right. Bring that other one up. This is it, guys. Essence Supper Club. My way. Delicious. Filling, soulful as everything should be in life. I hope you guys all had an amazing time. I know I did. I could hear you, but I feel you. Um, any questions, last minute questions? I already went over 25 minutes. Sorry guys. Well, we just wanna thank everyone for hanging out with us and it was totally worth the extra 25 minutes to just even be able to look at the crepes. Like we can't taste them, but <laughs> looking at them makes us happy. So, so beautiful. Uh, you'll see a little slide there that mentions our gift to you. So for anyone that's been waiting to buy some Heston, tonight's the night, buy a Heston set. 
and you get two tickets for the next event. I have some insider information that Claudette may be doing some events in the very near future. And so you can pick those. Uh, we'll also be doing a book tour with Giada De Laurentiis. You could pick those. So lots of options. Buy your set tonight. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Thank you, everyone.